Hi, welcome to our Centro Church online service. We're so glad that you could join us today, whether it's the first time you've watched or whether you're re-watching because you enjoyed the message. Hey, if this is your first time joining us today, there's a little QR code that's coming up on your screen right now. If you could scan that one, there's a new to Centro section or link that you can click and you can fill out your information and one of our team will get in touch with you. There's also a number of other links that you can click to explore as well. We know that you'll be so blessed by our message today and you'll see us again at the end of the service. So why don't we check out today's message? Well, hi. Why don't we thank the band? What an awesome morning. I mean, my goodness. The music was pumping. The Fogmaster 5000 was pumping out a heavenly mist. The, the, the song leader was incredibly beautiful. But she's my daughter-in-law. I'm not just being a creepy old guy, okay? There, just so you know that. Hey, it was just great. I mean, you could feel the presence of God so tangibly this morning. And, and we're going to speak about that more in just a moment. I'd just like you to, to bow your heads for a moment. Bow your heads. If you're, um, if you're sitting in the middle of the auditorium, I'd like you to just extend your hand towards the, to your right. I just want to pray for Wendy Hill this morning. You can you can stay bowing, Wendy, <laughs> if you don't want. Wendy, I was just I was praying this morning, and I and I I just had a picture of your your face, and uh, and I and I saw you, and I, I saw your striking white hair change and 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 just become darker, because I believe God is renewing your energy, and I feel like you're going to be led through a season of of personal renewal. God wants to draw you into something brand new, a new season of, of union and intimacy with him. And he's preparing you for the most powerful, most effective season of your life. He wants you to know that you're not forgotten. He sees you and he invites you into a season of transitional blessing. Why don't we just pray for Wendy? Father God, we just seal this moment. We just allow your presence to, to cement this into Wendy's psyche. Father, I pray that you would have your hand richly upon her, that you would visit yourself upon her and Peter in, in a new way and do new things because that is your nature and we thank you for that and we all say amen. Okay, we have started well, I think, because we're talking about Holy Spirit this morning. We're talking about the supernatural. We've, we're in our series, Matriarchs and Patriarchs, and there has been a lot of practical things that have come up, come out of that, that series. This morning is not going to be one of those. There's not going to be much practical, I can say. So let's start off. I want to tell you a story. In 1917, with World War I at its height, back in England, in the north of England, two young girls in a village called Cottingley, they were cousins. One was called Francis Griffith and one was called Elsie Wright. They, were, they, were, they came home from playing and their, their outfits were filthy and their mother got into them. She got stuck into them. They were in big trouble. But they said that it wasn't their fault. They said that fairies were to blame, that fairies had lured them down to the creek near where they lived. And they said that fairies had lured them into the water and that's how they got dirty. Their mother didn't take them seriously, so they decided to prove it. And they got hold of Elsie's father's camera and went back to the creek to capture the fairies on film. When they came back, Elsie's father developed the photos and what appeared on the first plate was a little bit unbelievable. There was Frances with four fairies fluttering around her in the, in the, in the weeks that followed they got more photos, and one of which is behind you, and there's another one as well. And they had five images of each of the girls and both of them surrounded by fairies. Elsie's father had his doubts about this, but her mother actually tended towards that. She tended towards believing them. And she was actually in a group that studied the paranormal and the supernatural. And a couple of years later, she shared these images with the group. And things just took on a life of their own. Prominent figures started to be, be interested in this. They started to take notice. And in December 1920, the Cottingley Fairies went mainstream. This British magazine called The Strand published a story on the girls and the fairies and how that came about. 
and the magazine sold out overnight. The last paragraph of the article said about the fairies, and I quote, the recognition of their existence will jolt the material 20th century mind out of its heavy ruts in the mud and will make it admit that there is a glamour and mystery to life. And that was written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who created Sherlock Holmes. The photos remained a point of controversy. They, if you look at them, can you put them back up again? They have a sort of a mesmerising quality about them. And so the story persisted, persisted for 66 years. And finally, Francis, Francis and Elsie came clean. It was a hoax. It was fraudulent activity. They created the photos with paper fairies. I mean, to our trained technical minds, we can see that. But back in the 1920s, they thought it was real. They didn't think of it as fraud. They thought of it as just a bit of fun. And Francis said, people often say to me, don't you feel ashamed for making these poor people look like fools because they believed in you? And she said, I don't, because they wanted to believe. That deep down in each one of us, created with the image of a creative supernatural God, there is a tendency, a bias towards the supernatural. The people were ready to believe. All they needed was something to believe in. See, we humans come with a built-in capacity for the supernatural, yeah? We do. And even though sometimes we don't practice it and we don't see it, when it occurs around us, it touches a nerve. It draws out an ancient echo, and why is that? It's because we're created by a supernatural God. And that's where we're headed this morning in our Matriarchs and Patriarchs series, where we look at heroic Christian lives. We're headed into the supernatural side of the Christian life, the mysterious, the mystical, and the spooky. So, our matriarch this morning is like no other of the matriarchs and patriarchs that we've spoken about this morning the, in the series by the fact that she is still alive, alive and kicking, and I'm talking about none other than Jackie Pullinger, British missionary to Hong Kong. And my title this morning is Chasing the Dragon. Chasing the Dragon it was Jackie Pullinger, Pullinger's first book, and it's also uh, a sort of a euphemism for in, in the Hong Kong area for doing heroin, for taking heroin or opium. So, Jackie Pullinger has an incredible story. It will, it will make you feel like you're not even a Christian. Um, there she is. She's, uh, she, she grew up in, in around London, and she always felt that she would be a missionary as a girl, but um, she moved more towards music in her teenage years. And then late in that studying period of music in, in her late teenage years, she, she sort of renewed her relationship with God. And, and the call to missions became stronger and stronger in her life. And she couldn't find a missions agency to support her. So she decided to speak to her vicar. And the vicar said, well, if God's told you you must go, then you must go, which was a lot less simple than it seemed. So she followed the vicar's advice and she got on a boat, not knowing where she was going, and she just decided that God would show her when to get off. And in Hong Kong, he did. He told her to get off, and all she had was her suitcase and a 10-pound note and nothing more, just a willing spirit, a degree in the oboe, <laughs> that's all. And the only reason she got into Hong Kong in the first place was that the immigration officers allowed her in because her mother's godson was a policeman there. And she found work as a primary school teacher in the Kowloon area. But then she went to work in a place called the Walled City. The Walled City. We have a photo of that. You've got to see this place. That's the Walled City. Uh, it was a slum, a 14-storey slum with one working toilet. A lot of drains that became working toilets, but that was the sort of place it was. And it was run by Chinese criminal triad gangs. It was the world's largest opium producing center. It was virtually a, a slum full of opium dens, prostitution, porn theaters. It profited from crime, extortion, violence, 
and uh, which was absolutely rife. It was a really, really sick place to be. And Jackie Pullinger found herself there. Initially, she saw very little success in her ministry. She was trying to get drug addicts off opium and heroin. She didn't have much success. Uh, she had a lot of people following her round, but she said that they were rice Christians, hoping that they could get a handout from what they perceived to be this rich British missionary. So then things took a turn for the better. She was reading her Bible and she read about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and how, how people were baptized in the Holy Spirit in the Bible and they spoke in other tongues and they got power to minister. And so she asked God, she said, God, this is what I need. This is what's missing. And so she prays for it and she's baptized in the Holy Spirit and starts speaking in, in other tongues. And then things took a turn for the better. She credits, she credits the baptism in the Holy Spirit with turning things around. And so she got to work. She began to pray heroin addicts off heroin in four hours. In four hours. She got crime bosses to surrender their lives to Jesus and prostitutes to quit. Prostitutes in that walled city were from the age of five upwards. So, yeah, and later she established a, a youth center that helped the drug, drug, addicts, drug addicts and street sleepers in the walled city. She gave them a place of refuge. If you want to see more about her, there's a really good video on YouTube. It's a, a documentary by this smooth British journo called Alan Wicker. And, and he's talking to Jackie Pullinger and, and she's telling him what she does. And every time he tries to divert her away from that, she just sticks to saying, no, no, we're getting drug addicts off drugs, and blah, blah, blah. And in the end, he, you can see that he is just, he, he's just struck with her and that he, he really thinks he's impressed. It's clear in the video. And he says to her, you know what? I think you're rather a good egg. And, and, uh, and so it's worth a look. Jackie Pullen just speaks like a member of the royal family. She has this Croydon accent, you know. It really sounds posh. But, yeah, but he's really taken with her. It's a good video. It's, if, you just, if you just go onto YouTube and, and, uh, and search Alan Wicker, Jackie Pullinger, you'll find it. She's still in Hong Kong. She's still there 55 years later, now 77 year, years old, sort of a Mother Teresa with the supernatural. So there she is. That's her story. And I want to use that to set up talking about the supernatural power of God encounter all of that together this morning. First of all, I want to read a scripture. Uh, I want to read, it's an important scripture. It's Jesus quoting the prophet Isaiah. And he's doing that because it talks about his own anointing, the anointing that he operated under. And the scripture is in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. Let's read it together. It says this, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is speaking about an anointing, a, a strange and supernatural enabling that he would carry throughout his life and ministry. And then before he left the earth, he would pass it on to his followers so we could get in on the act of setting people free. So let's get into that. I want to start off by unpacking some famous Jackie Pullinger quotes. These are just things that she has said, and it applies to us and how, and we can use it as like an introduction to getting more and more of the supernatural into our lives. The first quote is this, number one, I don't have a ministry, I have a life. I decided to share my life and my time and my room and my rice. Jackie Pullinger believed, and she still does, that she doesn't have a ministry, that her ministry is actually to live her life, the outworking of her walk with God in front of the unsaved, in front of drug addicts and prostitutions. That's her ministry, to actually live out her relationship with God in front of people. And that is ministry enough, yeah? Come on, make some noise. Yeah. And she went to, she went to people, she went to drug addicts and prostitutes, and she tried saying, Jesus loves you. And they didn't know who Jesus was, and some of them had never, ever been loved, so that didn't work. So she decided to share her time, her room, and her rice, to let her life be the testimony of what Jesus was doing. And so she allowed people into her world and just lived her life in front of them. That is a very simple, very effective way 
of, of bringing Jesus to our city, yeah? Yeah, it reminds me of a, of a quote from Pastor Bill Johnson from Bethel in, in California. When someone visiting their church asked him, could they, could they join his mall outreach team? And he sort of scratched his head and, and asked his leaders, do we, do we have a mall outreach team? And they said, no, I don't think so. What they actually had were people who believed in God, people who were born again, people who moved in the supernatural, who went to the mall to shop. And outreach just occurred naturally because of that. That's what should happen. So we have Holy Spirit. We have energy within us and we shop. So we're an outreach team wherever we go. Yeah? Second quote is, they said I wasn't qualified. And by all denominational standards, Jackie Pullinger wasn't qualified. She graduated from the Royal London College of Music and she studied the oboe. That's all she had. She went to Hong Kong not having a clue. She had a Bible and her Holy Spirit and her and Holy Spirit, and she didn't actually have any indicators to tell her what couldn't be done. So she, I, re, I remember telling her telling the story of her first convert, how she tried to reach this young guy, this young Chinese guy who, who was around the walled city, and she started a table tennis club because that's sort of the national sport over there. And, and she tried to win this guy for Jesus. And she was, she was obsessed with him day and night. And she said, I felt like I was falling in love with him. That's what she said. And she said, and then I realized I was just feeling God's heart for him. And that, that's how sometimes it can feel when you become obsessed with a friend and you're praying for them. And, and, and it, can feel like, it can feel like you're feeling God's heart for them. But he never did give his life to Jesus, but his best friend did, and her ministry was underway. Jackie Pullinger was qualified, activated, and commissioned because of her obedience, her obedience to a mission's call. Third quote, to the spiritual person, the supernatural seems natural. I don't remember if you, I don't know if you remember Mike Pilavachi, uh, an English preacher who's spoken here. Mike Pilavachi and his friend Andy Croft did a chart of, of the supernatural and how it works. He, he's very much a man who moves in the supernatural, moves in the power of God. And he did this, they, did, they did this chart. And the only two names of humans on it were Jesus Christ and Jackie Pullinger. So you've got an idea of, of what we're talking about here. When I was working for Teen Challenge back in the 90s, that's the 1990s, uh, we brought, we brought Jackie Pullinger to Brisbane for one night only in the Sheraton Hotel. It was, it was an amazing night, and uh, I actually got to meet her. And I've got to say, I've never been more terrified of a woman in all my life. She, for a start, for a start, when she saw the lush Sheraton carpet and the, the, the expensive-looking chairs, she was ticked off. She was starting to think all of this could have been given to helping the poor. And, and, I, and I sort of managed to creak out the words, well, we, we got a special deal, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but she just had this, this, this scary persona. And while, when I say that, I also felt that I could easily follow her into hell if the situation required it. But she just moved so naturally in a realm of the supernatural that I hadn't seen be, before or since. But I don't want you to take my word for it. There was somebody else there that night a trusted voice in this auditorium. I just want to welcome to the stage Carol Han. Carol was there and something pretty powerful happened in Carol's life. Carol, why don't you tell us about it? Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, I went along to see Jackie Pullinger and I'm not the type of person to go to different churches or to even follow different people. Um, but I just really felt to go. And there was a lot of people there that night. And uh, as she was talking, um, all of a sudden she said, right there, the Spirit of God is hovering above you. And I knew, I just knew, even though there were so many people, I knew it was me she was talking about. And then 
the Spirit of God fell on me and my whole body just started to not tremble. I was actually shaking all over my whole body from the head right down to my feet. And I felt people's hands come on me from behind. And um, she started to talk about where I'd come from, what had happened to me. But she said, God's going to use all that. God's going to use every single hurt, every single thing that's happened to you. God's going to turn that around and use it. And it wasn't long after that that I became coordinator of Henna's. I worked there for 21 years. Then I worked over here. And so it's like God turned my hurt into a comfort that I could reach out and comfort others. So I just want to say this woman, I have never, ever had anything like that happen to me before or since. So she really is spirit-filled. Well done, Carol. The, the English evangelist Leonard Ravenhill said that Jackie Pullinger is the most anointed woman alive. So having said all of that, Let's look at the supernatural and how we can fit that in to our lives. I mean, now some of you, when, when, when we speak about this, when we speak about the, 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 the mystical, spooky side of God, it usually divides a congregation. Oh, that stuff just doesn't happen anymore. And people who are full on after it. Okay? I want you to all be in the full on after it camp today. Okay? So let's, let's dive in. First of all, first thing, number one, a theology of the supernatural. That's what we need. We need a theology of the supernatural, something from the Bible. So we're going to look at some scriptures soon. And I'm going to actually share some personal testimonies as well. And Carol's testimony, you've already heard. But, but having heard those testimonies, see, testimonies set a precedent. They are a precedent in heaven. And I want you to, to let faith rise in you today. Let faith for this rise in you. Because you know, we've, we've been talking about Holy Spirit all year. And next year, we want to take him and ourselves into the community and start winning people for Jesus and seeing our church grow. And, and so I want you to begin to imagine, not a church of hundreds, but a church in the thousands. And if, that, if that's uncomfortable for you, if you like things small, then you know, God never promised comfort. Okay? So let's, with that mindset, let's attack this. Very early on in my walk with God, I was told, no, all of that finished when the last apostle died. Well, that's not true. That's not true. We're going we're gonna to refute that with a scripture in a moment. And the other thing was that it only happened to certain people, sovereign vessels, people born under a star or something like that. You know? so, and that's not true either. And the other thing was that it only happened in certain places, out of the way places where God did things and we only would hear about that. But one night before he died, Jesus is eating the Passover with, his, with his, uh, his disciples. As the night wears on, and they, they, they're finishing their meal, he makes a stunning statement. And I want to read it to you in uh, John chapter 14, verse 12. It says this, Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. Okay, so that's not sovereign vessels. It's not finished. Whoever believes in me will do greater works than Jesus did. If he just said, you'll just do, do what I did, that would have been enough. That would have been confronting enough. But he said, no, you're going to do greater works than these. We're going to do greater works than these. Can you believe for that? I always thought this was one of the most challenging scriptures in the New Testament. Maybe you think that, that the supernatural is something that happens through someone else's life. Let's get rid of that mindset. Second scripture comes from Romans chapter 15, verse 19. It says this, By the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God, so from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel. So the gospel is only fully proclaimed when signs and wonders accompany it. We see that. If... if it's only fully proclaimed. We can half proclaim it or three quarters proclaim it without signs and wonders, but it's only fully proclaimed when there are signs and wonders. Next scripture is Mark chapter 16, 
verses 17 to 18. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. When they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. So there we have some powerful scriptures, folks. We have to take them at face value because in this last one, Jesus commissions and he describes and he gives momentum to what should be the normal Christian life. We will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Every Christian must have a theology for the supernatural, a theology of the miraculous. And that theology must contain the fact that that the miraculous is both necessary and available to us. We've got to have a theology that God will confirm his word with signs following. So often we create our theology around what doesn't happen. And yeah, and we've prayed for people, sick people to recover, and they haven't. And sometimes they've died, and it's been tragic. But that doesn't change the fact, the authority of what the Scripture says. The Scripture says that God is a supernatural God and he will do supernatural works through us. And so we pick ourselves up, we dust ourselves off, and we reaffirm that we believe in you, God. We believe that you are a supernatural God. Despite what may have happened, despite what we may have seen, we give allegiance to what you're doing in the earth in a supernatural way. Don't revise your theology downward in order to explain your experience. In fact, don't try to explain why things don't happen, just go to God and lay it all out before him, yeah? So, God is a God of the miraculous. We need to retain language for that in our lives. God intends for things to be fluid and life-giving, carrying breakthrough and purpose, and all of that is deposited on us. We're designed that way, and when it's not that way, it doesn't mean that we've done something wrong, It doesn't mean that great sin has entered the house. What it means is we just haven't arrived yet. We're on a journey. It means we're learning to apprehend what God has promised and deliver it into the the lives of people around us. We're becoming someone who can contain the fullness of what God is saying and doing. Let's look at another scripture. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 and 5. Paul saying, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Saying to the Corinthian church, don't believe what I tell you unless I accompany it with God's power. The gospel must be accompanied by power, or it's not the whole gospel. So we need a theology of signs and wonders, and I've just given you like the the uh, entree there with a few scriptures to have a theology of signs and wonders we have to have a theology of connection with God that that is the place of every believer in church in your car when you least expect it we need to expect to encounter God we need to expect to encounter God not hope that we do we inspect expect that we can encounter God we don't need Mount Sinai or a mighty rushing wind we just need a moment with him And that can be an encounter. John chapter 15, verse 7 and 8 says, If you remain in me, that means you remain in me. You don't go floating off, but you stay in the presence of God. Stay in connection with him. Ask whatever you will, whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. If you remain in me. This is the abiding life. It's an engaged participation with God. And it's not a a sometimes thing, it's an all times thing. There's an encounter, there's an exchange, there's relationship, there's intimacy, there's a connection in in an otherworldly sort of way. And in that connection, I'm positioned to think and to feel differently. There has to be an ongoing increased understanding of how God's word works. And we find that out in his presence, because that's our responsibility, increased heavenly perception must be our goal. Encounters bring revelation. Let me explain what I mean by that. You know that in the Bible, there's two times where where Jesus is in a boat, well, once he's in a boat with the disciples and they're going through a storm, and the other time, the disciples are in the boat and Jesus walks out to them on water. The first one happens with the disciples 
sailing their boat across the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus is having a snooze in the back. And a storm blows up, as they do over the Sea of Galilee, quite quickly, and they're quite dangerous as well. And the disciples are, are starting to get worried. They're starting to think that they might get, get swamped and they might sink. And so they wake Jesus up, and Jesus rubs his eyes, and he rebukes the storm, and the storm stops. And the, what do the, the disciples say? They say, what manner of man is this that even the wind and waves obey him? The next time, they're crossing the Sea of Galilee and Jesus is up on a mountain praying. And they've been fighting a storm all night and they're weary and they're they're desperate and they're frightened. So Jesus comes to them walking on water. And at first they think he's a ghost. They say that. It's it's a spirit because that's that's a a sort of a Jewish fishing uh, folklore that the spirits have drowned people in Lake Galilee. They, they will come and haunt the waters. And so they think that Jesus is a ghost. But he comes to them and he says to them, do not be afraid. It is I. Take courage. In fact, he doesn't quite say that. He says, instead of it is I, the actual Greek says, ego a me, which says, I am. The same sort of I am God said to Moses when Moses asked his name. So Jesus was actually giving them a big clue here. He says, take courage, I am, do not be afraid. And they get it. They get it because then they say, they they say, surely this man is the son of God. First encounter, it's who is this man? You know, he can do magic. He can do all sorts of tricks. And then it's, no, surely this man is the son of God. What happens through encounters is there is an increased revelation of who Jesus is and what he's able to do in our lives, what he's able to deliver through us. Those two encounters come about two chapters apart in, in the book of John. And, they, and one, he's just a man, and the next time, he's the son of God. So there's that increased revelation. If you want to start to get a series, a lifestyle of encounters happening in your world, then start with your Bible. Like my, my, my pre-salvation encounter with God came through reading his word. I, I started going out with this Salvation Army girl and I thought, well, she'll get over this Christian thing. But she didn't and she dragged me along to this Bible study at this, at this guy's place, and it was like a youth Bible study, and I thought, this is, this is kind of all right. And so the next, next day, I went to Brody's bookstore in Ipswich, because I didn't know there were Christian bookshops, and I bought a Good News Bible, and I started reading it. And as I'm reading it, I'm feeling my allegiance shift. I'm feeling my allegiance shift from where I was into where God wanted me to be. I can, I'm feeling this. I'm, I, it was tangible. I'm feeling this thing. And, I'm, 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 and, and, and the way I put it, the way I articulated it in those days was, I want to change camps. I want to change. And that just came through reading the scriptures, an encounter with God. That is a genuine, bona fide encounter. After, after I was, the night I was saved, I had another encounter with, with him. And then not long after that, I had another encounter in the scriptures where, where he spoke to me clearly. So start in the scriptures. Read, read, your, read your Bible until God speaks to you. And, and maybe he will shift something in your life. It's, it's there to be had. Let me tell you another story. Another encounter I had when I was in my late 20s. I, Brett was still in the womb when this happened. And, um, and I actually was playing touch footy and tore my hamstring. And the, a week after that, it hadn't recovered, hadn't got better. I went to a youth rally over at the old Raceview AOG church. And, and there was a, a, a guest speaker there. And, and at the end of the, the, the youth rally, it was sort of winding down. This guy from my own church went out and spoke to the MC, And um, the MC was trying to, to, to get rid of him, but he persisted. And, um, and he, he stood up and he, and he asked if anyone needed healing. And he called out a few sort of ailments 
and people went forward. And then he, and then he stood up and he described my injury and said, I, I, you know, there's a person, you've got pain in the back of your leg. It's, it's something that's, that's not right and it needs to be fixed up. And so I went out for prayer. And, and there were people already out there and, and they were mostly on the floor. But uh, anyway, so he prayed for me and, and I didn't feel anything. Not a, not a sausage, nothing, just there. Just, and I thought, okay, well, that, that didn't work. That, so I went home that night and I, I, I'm having a snooze, sleeping, and I wake up in the middle of the night and it feels like a whole squadron of masseurs are working on my leg. And I can feel the muscle moving and, and bending and twisting. And, and, and then I, I thought, okay, it's like three o'clock in the morning. I'm not going to do anything now. But when I woke up, I went out in the backyard and I did some sprints, you know, some, just some sprints, turning sideways and that, and it was perfectly fine. It was incredible. It was a, uh, yeah. you know what? Let, let me tell you this. The guy that prayed for me wasn't a leader. He wasn't a pastor. He was a greenkeeper at the bowls club who just wanted this on his life. And so he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. It's available. It's available to anyone. Okay? It's available to anyone. How much do you want it? Yeah. This guy was, I went to school with him. He used to get picked on him, bullied and everything like that. And there he's up there healing people in their 10s and 20s. And, you know, and so it was. Yeah. So expect to encounter God. Expect to encounter him. He wants to be with you. Third thing, tip your life towards the supernatural. If you want to increase the flow of God's spirit in your life, change your assumptions. You know those times when, when something's going on, you think something's going on, God's doing something, and you think, that could be God, but it's probably me. Change that around. Just change that around and say, that could be me, but it's probably God. Okay? Just change, that, change it that much. Change that much. Like, don't think, oh, this is circumstantial. No, think God is at work. God is working here. And then get your ears on and be listening. Be ready. I, that, that actual little switch for me changed so much around. It started a flow of the Holy Spirit in my life that, that is still going it's from when I started it. So remember that you are actually not a physical being having a spiritual experience. You're a spiritual being having a physical experience. And those things should be so easily, should so easily come to us. The spiritual part of you is more real than the physical part of you. So the spiritual is actually greater reality than the physical. So if that's true, then when something should happen, it happens, you should say, it's probably God, but it could be me. Or you could say, that's God. That's certainly God. And just change that little assumption in your life and it will bring you fruit, yeah? So, I've, I've done that. I've actually made it. It's God. It's God. Obviously, I filter out all voices telling me to rob a 7-Eleven or something like that. You know, that's clearly not God. But the increase in the flow was immediate and overwhelming. So, why don't we get the band to join us on the stage? Why don't you all come up? And let's just see. Let's just see what God might want to do. If we could get that phone to stop ringing. Um, now, all of this hinges not on whether you like the message, like the topic, like the delivery. It doesn't, doesn't hinge on that. It hinges on how you respond in your heart, how you respond to God. Not how you respond to me or the situation around you. How you respond to God. There's just too many verses in the Bible about signs and wonders to ignore them. But because there's so many things in our lives that it feels normal to not be able to do, we sometimes adopt a lesser stance regarding the supernatural than we should. Because there's so many things we, we think we can't do. There's so many things that we're not able to do. We settle for less than what God has for us. Why don't you stand with me?
sometimes we hate to say the word impossible, so we just behave it. We behave as if things are impossible. We just say, I won't try too hard. I won't move past the familiar. I'll stay right here. So part of what we have to do is confront that unwillingness in us to pursue more of what God has for us than what we're currently experiencing. Ask yourself, am I, am I willing to do that? Am I willing to push myself into something new that God has? Let's bow our heads. Father God, we just pray that you would visit yourself upon us here in this house today. That you would, you would come in power, that you would come ready to move in lives, ready to break people out of impossible situations, ready to set the captives free, ready to give recovery of sight to the blind, ready to do all of those things that you anointed your son to do but have now passed on to us. And Father, we ask for that to be absolutely present in this house. Lord, that we would see miracles on a regular basis in this house. We know that with God, nothing is impossible. And so we claim that now. We claim that now and we declare that now in Jesus' name. While you're still bowed, while you're still bowed, I want to pray for three particular groups of people this morning, but I don't want to restrict it to that. I want to pray for people who, number one, need a miracle in your life. You need a miracle in your life. When I was thinking about this, I counted the miracles that I need in my own life, and it's about seven. So we all, if we're honest about it, need some sort of touch, some sort of injection of the supernatural into our lives in some area. So if you need a miracle, I want to pray for you. I want to open up the altar. Number two is if you want an impartation of the supernatural. We will pray and agree with you for that this morning, an impartation of the supernatural. It's a, a, just a release to be able to let the flow of Holy Spirit happen out of your life. And number three, if you've managed to get through this year without being prayed for for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to speak in other tongues, I want you to, to come forward and we will pray for you this morning. We will pray for you to receive that and, and speak in other tongues. We'll, we have a team of people ready to pray for you, and they will ask you what you want to be prayed for. And if you just tell them which of the three, or if it's not one of the three, just tell them anyway. And we're going to sing, and please, the altar is open. Please come forward, and we'll pray for you in those three areas. Thank you, Amy. Even when I can feel it, you are there. You never stop. We're so glad that you could join us for our Centro Church online service. If you did want to connect with us, don't forget to scan the QR code and fill out your details. Also, if there was something in the message that stood out to you and you'd like to say yes to Jesus, then scan that QR code, click the Say Yes to Jesus link, and one of our pastoral team will get in contact with you this week. We hope and pray that you'll join us at one of our live services next week, either at 5 Pring Street Ipswich at 9am or 5pm, or at our Collingwood Park location at Woodlink State School at 10 a.m. Blessings from our senior pastors, Pastor Tim and Pastor Catherine Spark, and all of the team here at Centro. Have a blessed day.